Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another webinar hosted by uh, Wildlife SOS. Uh, International Day of Biological Diversity was uh, just around the corner on the 22nd of May. And uh, this day aims to raise awareness about the importance of biodiversity, complexity in these ecosystems, and the need to protect it. Uh, the reason being biodiversity across the world is under uh, imminent threat uh, at the moment. And on today's webinar, we will be looking into a habitat that evokes curiosity among many. Uh, when one thinks of high altitude, uh, the image that comes into mind is uh, endless snow-capped mountains, dry uh, shrubs, scrubs, and uh, other types of uh, alpine vegetation, uh, along with some elusive uh, animals that uh, <clears throat> call it home. Uh, so how do they adapt uh, to survive in this climate? And uh, what are the threats that these animals could possibly face in these regions? Uh, after all, these pristine glaciers and untouched lands uh, seem unaffected by human endeavors. Uh, however, these assumptions are actually quite false. Uh, because these areas are also under uh, uh, threat and uh, a lot of native wildlife in these regions are also hugely affected uh, by, by us. Uh, so who better to talk about, uh, you know, high altitude uh, with than uh, Ms. Alia Mir. Uh, so Alia Mir is our project officer at the Wildlife SOS Jammu and Kashmir project. Uh, with several years of experience working in this field and this landscape, uh, she is well versed in rescuing snakes, birds, reptiles, mammals, you name it, and she's done it all. Uh, so she is a huge inspiration to all young girls and a huge inspiration to everybody within Wildlife SOS as well. And uh, so anybody who's getting into conservation should definitely look into Alia Ma'am's work. And uh, so with that, I would like to hand over the session to Miss Alia, and uh, who will uh, be very happy to share her knowledge today uh, with, uh, with all of us. So over to you, Alia Ma'am. Thank you so much, Anisha. Hi, everyone. This is uh, Alia Mir. Uh, as Anisha introduced me, I'm project manager for Wildlife SOS. Uh, but being, uh, you know, a wildlife worker, a wildlife conservationist, I have felt myself fortunate enough to have, you know, an opportunity to work with few of the highland uh, species in my native place from past 15 years. And it has been, uh, a learning process all these years and what I have learned throughout my journey, I will be briefly sharing with you all through my today's presentation. So I'll be talking about uh, the uniqueness of the wildlife species we have in our higher altitudes. And talking about higher altitudes, the first picture that comes to our mind is of the Himalayan mountains, the highest, the youngest, the largest chain of mountains in the world. The Himalayan range is one of the most fascinating and spectacular natural wonders on earth, but that's not enough. It is more than that. It is one of the richest stores of animal life. For example, it is remarkable that almost one third of the world's mammalian species that may be called true mountains, um, uh, true mountain animals uh, are native to these uh, na uh, mountain ranges. So, so today, I'll be talking about the wildlife we have in Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh range that falls in the greater Himalayan range. First, let me just adjust. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, so as I uh, mentioned today, I'll be talking about the wildlife that uh, resides in these lofty uh, mountain peaks, uh, and. I will be briefly talking about the animals uh, that fall in Jammu, Kashmir and Ladakh regions. So uh, as you can uh, see that the total uh, area of all these three regions is 101,387 square kilometers 
with Jammu having the region of uh, area of about 26,293 square kilometers, Kashmir having the least uh, area uh, of about 15,948 square kilometers. But here I would uh, you know, like to uh, share that Kashmir has the 50% of uh, its area, its geographical area as the protected area network falling under the uh, forest cover range. So we are richest in the forest cover range. And Ladakh is the uh, uh, largest of all these three regions, having the area of about 59,146 kilometers. And it is also one of the world's highest regions. So we can you know, uh, sum up as the highest and uh, the lowest peaks can be uh, found in all these three regions, Jammu, Kashmir, and Ladakh. Uh, it is, you know, rightly said that climate and altitude has a profound influence on the inhabitants of this place, their social, their cultural, economic, and other aspects of life are directly or indirectly governed by the climate. The climate of the state ranges from the burning and scorching heat of the plains of Jammu division with an elevation of 247 meters above sea level at the Chenab Valley. You will never see such you know, variation in the range, in the climate, and you know, all the topography of these three regions, which are uh, you know, uh, just 300 kilometers apart from each other. So there is a huge variation, and all this variation is just because of the climate and the topography of the uh, Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh. So as I was uh, explaining that uh, Jammu has the maximum elevation of 247 meters above sea level uh, at the Chenab Valley. And Kashmir having the highest peak as Sasar Kangri with an elevation of 7,672 uh, meters above sea level. And Ladakh having the highest range as Saltoro Kangri, named Saltoro Kangri, having the elevation of uh, 7,742 uh, uh, meters above sea level. So from here, you can see that few of the highest elevated peaks falls in these uh, Kashmir and uh, Ladakh regions. All these represent three different climatic regions of these zones. You know, there is a lot to say about the climate of uh, Jammu, Kashmir, and Ladakh. So I just want to, you know, speak uh, the main things about uh, this climate and topography. So broadly, we can say that Jammu, Kashmir, and Ladakh comprises three uh, distinct climatic regions. Uh, Ladakh having the cold arid deserts, whereas uh, its temperature that varies from minus 40 degrees Celsius to plus four degrees Celsius during the summers. Whereas it has minus 40, uh, you know, the temperature dips to minus 40 degrees Celsius during the winters. Kashmir enjoying the temperate climate, uh, you know, it has the maximum range of 35 to minus four degrees Celsius of temperatures. Whereas the humid subtropical region of Jammu, uh, where it raises, uh, where temperature, you know, ranges from plus 40 degrees Celsius, you know, you can see how much it is variating from just Jammu to Ladakh, minus 40 to plus 40. That's a huge difference. And in this context, Lawrence quotation boldly you know, stands out. He says that every 100 feet of elevation brings uh, some new phase of climate and the vegetation. And in a short ride of 30 miles, one can pass from overpowering heat to climate delightfully cool. So this is, I think, very rightly said about the Jammu Kashmir state. Moving on, uh, we have in Kashmir some of the, you know, beautiful protected area networks. And uh, in this network, we have uh, five uh, national parks, uh, Dachigam being uh, world's the, you know, one of the beautiful national parks and one of the well-managed national parks having the area of 141 uh, square kilometers. 
Then there is another national park in Kashmir, which is called Salim Ali National Park, having the area of nine square kilometers. So we have two national parks in Kashmir. Then uh, another third uh, uh, national park in Kashmir, which has been recently notified, is Kazina, which falls in the north division of Kashmir. Uh, and it has an area of 160 square kilometers. Then we have uh, Kishtawad National Park, which falls in Jammu, having the area of 2190 square kilometers. And then we have the largest and the highest uh, protected area network national park called Hemis National Park, having the area of 4,400 square kilometers. Along with these, we have 14 wildlife sanctuaries, 37 conservation reserves, and uh, four Ramsar sites. Ramsar sites, as you must be, you know, uh, very well aware about, that it is, uh, you know, it's it's an international treaty for the conservation and sustainable use of wetlands, which was signed in Ramsar city of Iran. That's why it's known as the Ramsar Convention, and it was signed in 90, 1971, and it came into execution in 1975. So Hemis National Park in Ladakh, it's the largest notified protected area in India. And so the largest one, uh, and it has a unique wildlife biodiversity. So there is few of the faunal uh, diversity of Jammu and Kashmir. There we have uh, 372 mammals in India. And among that number, we have 37 species found in uh, Jammu and Kashmir then you can see there are uh, 1,175 birds in India and we have 358 species. And thanks to the you know, very enthusiastic birders of Jammu and Kashmir who are adding numbers to this checklist and the number is going on. So uh, among the number of uh, reptile species 399, we have 68 species uh, which have been uh, you know, identified in Jammu and Kashmir and 14 amphibians, 158 butterfly species. So total, uh, you know, we have 571 uh, number of species, number of biodiversity in Jammu and Kashmir. And this is very minimal, uh, just few of them. So some of the wild animals which have adapted to high altitude, uh, these are few, uh, you know, animals which have uh, which have been found in these high mountain peaks and which have, uh, you know, fought with the harsh climate, with the tough times the, these mountain peaks give them. But still, they, uh, you know, in spite of all these, they thrive in these uh, high mountain peaks, high altitudes. So one of the most well-known creatures native to Himalayas is snow leopard, who, uh, you know, unfortunately is considered as vulnerable by the IUCN uh, red, uh, you know, red list data. But this is the species which is near threatened in the Himalayas, in the Jammu Kashmir and Ladakh areas. Snow leopards, they are known, they are very well known as, you know, the ghost of the mountains because of their elusive nature. They can typically be found above the altitude of 4,000 uh, meters to 6,000 meters above sea level. And they are found in 12 uh, nations, 12 countries throughout the world, uh, among which China, Bhutan, Nepal, India, Pakistan, Russia, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, these are the few. So 12 state, uh, 12 uh, nations in the world, we have snow leopard, but in India, we uh, have snow leopard in only the Himalayan range. Uh, like we have uh, Himachal Pradesh, Ladakh, Jammu and Kashmir, and then the, uh, you know, the lower Himalayan ranges. Then talking about the brown bear, which is next in the hierarchy of predators in Himalayan uh, ranges. So this is very well known as Himalayan brown bear, which is the subspecies of brown bears. 
uh, subspecies of brown bears in uh, you know North America and all other um, American states. But uh, due to inaccessible inaccess and uh, very high altitudes, this is the species which has been poorly studied in India, as well as in other parts of the Asian um, uh, Asian highlands. One thing here I would like to uh, share with you that uh, there is the wrong perception in common man that uh, you know these brown bears they are typical carnivores and they eat fish only and you know um, and all such things. But I would like to mention here that the diet of most brown bears can be more than eighty percent vegetarian. So you know that is something new for the common people. Uh, since these brown bears, they have the keen sense of smelling. They can smell their prey or they can smell uh, their food from uh, the distance of two miles. So that's, that's uh, you know, something very unique of these species. Uh, these also, you know, they face the threat of climate change and other anthropogenic factors. Then talking about the Himalayan wolves, uh, they're also called as Tibetan wolves, uh, which live at more than 4,000 meter altitude. And they are unique as they are genetically distinct from gray wolves. During one of the recent research, the researchers collected 280 uh, fecal samples of wolf from across the Tibetan plateau of China. Uh, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and studied the micro, mitochondrial DNA. And, you know, interestingly, the genetic analysis revealed a clear divergence of Himalayan wolves and marked them as a separate breed. Unlike gray wolves that inhabit the lower elevations uh, of the Himalayas, they showed these Himalayan wolves, they showed the, you know, uh, clear hypoxia adaptation means they can uh, try well in less oxygen availability. And the specialized genes for hypoxia adapt adaptation allowed the animals to overcome the lack of oxygen at such high altitudes. The Himalayan mammalian herbivores, uh, which is more than 20 species in the Himalayas, and they belong to six families, uh, among which eight of them belong to the uh, ungulate families. To name few, we have Tibetan gazelle, Tibetan antelope, the blue sheep, then Ladakh oriole, Asiatic ibex, uh, argali, Tibetan wild ass, which is also known as kiang, and wild yak. Ladakh, Uriel, and Tibetan antelope, they are put under the endangered list by the IUCN. Tibetan gazelle is, uh, you know, a small antelope. It's, a, it's an antelope which is um, almost of the uh, weight of 15 kgs. And it has uh, a grayish brown body and a short black tip tail. The Tibetan uh, wild ass, which is the... Uh, First picture, this is known as the Patan wild ass or Kiang in the local language, is the largest wild ass in the world with some stallions standing uh, up to 4.6 feet height. And they weigh up to 400 kgs. Then blue sheep, which is at the bottom corner of, uh, of the right, uh, sorry, of the right side. It is the picture of the uh, blue sheep and it's very unique mountain ungulate that is somewhere between, you know, it has the features of sheep and goat. It displays both the characteristics. Then the picture in the second line, the first one, uh, it is, Lada, uh, sorry, it is Argali, Tibetan Argali, and it's the largest wild sheep in the world. And uh, then we have Ladakh Uriel, which is a small wild sheep. Uh, found in these Himalayan rains. The ascetic ibex, uh, which is at the right top, 
is it's a majestic wild goat it's a goat wild goat and the species is the second most abundant wild ungulate in ladakh after blue sheep then the tibetan antelope it's a graceful um, animal which is uh, being slaughtered for its much valued wool known as shahtush which is one of the finest natural uh, you know fibers in the world and it is popularly known as the king of the wolves so these are few of the mountain species we have in jammu and kashmir along with the markhor uh who is you know found in two uh, areas in jammu and kashmir in the uh, in the hirpura wildlife sanctuary and uh, in the kazi nag national park then we have some unique uh, high altitude bird species uh, in these uh, you know uh, high peaks bar headed goose which is one of the highest flying birds in the world uh, it habitats in the high altitude lakes and wetlands of somrari in ladakh and it is uh, the state bird of ladakh they are actually uh, the migrant migratory birds that fly over the himalayas uh, in the winter season to spend the winter season in india uh from assam rajasthan karnataka and in tamil nadu then we have a uh, himalayan golden eagle we have uh, himalayan golden eagle is you know uh, that's known to hunt large prey uh, which is uh, many times larger than its um, size and the weight we have griffon vultures which is the largest and the heaviest bird found in the himalayas uh its wing span is almost 9 to 10 feet you know that's very huge uh so these are few of the uh, unique bird species of uh the himalayan mountains of these high altitude mountains but uh you know this is a fact that high altitude offers extreme environments with uh, gusty winds low levels of oxygen high levels of ultraviolet radiations and cold temperatures you know they challenge the survival of many species and animals have evolved in high elevation environments typically you know they exhibit numerous adaptations to counter these environmental challenges but anthropogenic threats they further aggravate to these hardships for these animals in these rigid terrains uh, the anthropogenic um, you know threats they can be anything like habitat degradation and fragmentation tourism trekking and so many other things or land use transformation so to overcome these uh, you know the wildlife in these high altitudes they have some they have some adaptations which are both temporary or permanent to talk about these adaptations uh we will you know one by one discuss them and we we can see that these wild animals Uh, at high altitudes are among the most resilient in the natural world this is how they survive because they are resilient they can stand they can withstand these harsh climates and these harsh temperatures in in these rigid areas they are elite athletes of the animal world that's why they can you know they can run like anything on these steep mountains it is cold for them all the year round so they have to generate heat by maintaining very high metabolic rates and for this how do they do it for this they have they definitely have to make some adaptations but you know all these adaptations um, all these mechanisms uh, they make or or all these adaptations they make they work like a single complex there are few of the adaptations you know that can be broadly broadly uh, categorized as morphological adaptations 
physiological adaptations, biochemical adaptations, genetic adaptations, and behavioral adaptations. But all these adaptations, they work like a single complex mechanism. And all the adaptations are interdependent on each other and form the basis for each other so that this animal could survive in these, uh, you know, uh, in these terrains. And we will one by one discuss all the adaptations. So first we'll talk about the morphological adaptations. Morphological adaptations are physical changes that help them to enhance their fitness in a given, uh, you know, environmental changes. Some of the animals have long, thick fleas for covering the entire body to contain body heat and repel moisture. Uh, they have relatively shorter size of the limbs and spongy rubber-like foot pads for gripping on smooth, rocky surface in ungulates. Uh, here we can, you know, cite an example of uh, the snow leopard. His, uh, he has, uh, you know, the uh, paddy feet so that they can be, uh, they can, he can, you know, well run, predate over these steep mountains. They have the long, thick fleas so that they could retain the heat. They have short air and uh, so that they don't lose, you know, water to the environment. So to repel moisture, to, uh, uh, you know, to repel the uh, heat, to contain the body heat, they have the long, thick fleas for, you know, uh, and they have the long, thick um, tail, which helps it to balance in the steep mountains. The animals' morphological adaptations, they show well-developed chest to draw oxygen from the thin air of the high mountains. Again, snow leopard is a good example here. They have the short forelimbs with sizable paws, long hind limbs, so that they could, you know, climb up the mountain very well and can have a good grip on the steep rocks. And they have a thick tail for balancing on the rocky surfaces. Also the fur patterned with dark rosettes and spots enable them to blend into their surroundings so that it could hide itself from the predators or it could hide itself to prey on the animals. Few other uh, morphological adaptations, uh, like long sharp claw claws uh, and powerful digging strength, which helps the brown bears to dig dens for themselves, where they hibernate through the harsh winters. And it also helps, you know, the digging um, behavior. It also helps them to dig out the burrowing animals to feed upon. Short but robust legs and large claws, well adapted to digging, stout body and large head and incisors. These, all these attributes make martens fit to survive in foot scars and harsh climatic conditions of these um, uh, hilly regions. Wide furry paws in Eurasian links that helps them to walk on the snow without sinking into it. Wide span of the wings, along with a tremendous diving speed, helps the altitude birds to prey effectively, and that helps them to balance while preying on the animals, which are, you know, many times larger than these birds. Then we have physiological adaptations. Physiological adaptations can be viewed. Uh, you know, as mechanisms and processes that allow organisms to deal with internal changes. Higher concentration of erthocytes and hemoglobin in them, which, you know, uh, higher the concentration of erthocytes and hemoglobin, higher 
is the affinity of the animal to bind the oxygen into their cellular levels. So this is very much seen in all the uh, you know, Himalayan animals, all the high altitude animals. Then thin walled pulmonary arteries and alveolar septum. Again, it helps, you know, uh, thin walled pulmonary art, uh, arteries. They help the animals to diffuse the blood, to diffuse the oxygen to the tissues so that they could, uh, you know, thrive well in hypoxic environments. Few animals have larger heart and lungs to facilitate effective oxygen circulation. Delayed implantation of embryo in order to carry the pregnancy and give birth in favorable season to increase the chances of cub survival. This can be very well seen in uh, you know, bears, whether Himalayan brown bears or uh, Himalayan black bears. You know, hibernation in mammals, it's a seasonal state of metabolic suppression. And uh, you know, it makes the animal dormant characterized by uh, a decrease in the body temperature, metabolism, heart rate, and oxygen composition. It has been seen that hibernating bears, they undergo an array of physiological changes. Like, you know, these bears, the hibernating bears, they exhibit, when they go in the hibernation, they exhibit a drop in the body temperature, protein conservation, absence of urination and defecation. And in fact, they, you know, uh, they don't defecate, they don't urinate. And in spite, they use that mechanism to make the protein which is useful to their body. During hibernation, both captive and um, you know, uh, wild, both the bears, whether black or brown, they sh show the reduced levels of heart rate from 70 to 80 beats per minute to hibernating levels of around 19 to 29 per minutes of heartbeat. And these reductions in, you know, body temperature and heart rate are connected to the hibernator's energy saving and reductions in uh, metabolic weight. Furthermore, the females, they give birth to their cubs during hibernation so that, that you know, they could assure themselves the maximum survival of the cubs. And when they come out uh, in, after the hibernation, you know, uh, in April or May, the cubs, by then the cubs are more than uh, a month or a two. And some uh, small mammals like marmots, they also hibernate in family groups for, for at least five to six months. And their hibernation burrows are over 10 meters deep in some cases, it has been seen. The, uh, and you know, uh, such deep burrowing helps them to keep themselves warm and safe from the digging hunters. So, you know, these kinds of physiological adaptations, they, over the period of time, they come into these animals so that they could be safe from the uh, harsh uh, climatic conditions and the predators as well. And here, uh, larger heart uh, and lungs to facilitate effective oxygen. Okay, so uh, here I would like to explain this uh, point, delayed implantation of embryo in order to carry the pregnancy and give birth in favorable season to increase the chances of cub survival. This adaptation has seen in bears. And this is, you know, something very unique. Bears breed in June which is you know the best time when they come into heat and at that point the females eggs they are more fertilized so they divide to form a small clump of cells uh, which is you know known as blastocyst blastocyst and the next step in embryonic development is for a blastocyst to implant in the thickened 
you know, uh, uterus, nutrient rich uh, walls of the uterus. This animal, this then, you know, signals the blastocyst to continue developing into a fetus that is ready for the birth. But in bears, however, the blastocyst does not immediately get implanted into the uterine. Instead, it remains in the uterus, you know, uh, it remains dormant for months together. And ultimately, it gets implanted in the uterine walls of the mother bear uh, during November or December. And then the females give birth in January or February, means after uh, six to eight weeks of gestation period. And all this happens during their hibernation period only. And if the bears, if the mother bear are unable to gain sufficient weight during the uh, you know uh, autumn months or the autumn season or during the fall uh, to healthy this blastocyst they keep this dormant until they gain the weight or until they gain the health status which is perfect for giving the birth to the cubs. So, you know, uh, this then allows these bears to respond directly to the food conditions of a certain year and to only give birth during the years when these cubs and mothers would have a higher chance of survival. So this is very unique and very, uh, you know, uh, unique adaptation of these animals. Then uh, another adaptation large lungs and dense network of blood vessels in wing muscles in birds flying over high altitude areas. You know, uh, if we compare similarly sized animals with the, with the birds, with the high altitude birds, these birds, they have the larger hearts that enhance their cardiac output you know, that helps them to absorb more oxygen, that helps them to intake, uh, to increase the intake of oxygen. In addition, birds also have enhanced capacity for tissue oxygen diffusion. You know, uh, since their pulmonary are, are walls, they are thin. So that can help them to have effective tissue oxygen diffusion. That means they can effectively transport this oxygen to their uh, cells and directly to the mitochondria that can provide them with the energy that they need to uh, fly over these high mountain peaks. So they overcome the hypoxic environment either by increasing the breathing frequency or by increasing the tidal volume. You know, either they will increase it by uh, in, uh, breathing frequency, they will breathe fast, they will increase the breathing frequency, or by increasing the tidal volume, means they will flap their uh, wings rapidly so that, you know, that uh, fine tune them to support its metabolic rate and that give them the uh, oxygen rich environment so that they could be. Uh, they could, you know, uh, be safe during the hypo hypoxic environment. For example, if we talk about the bar-headed goose, they can increase oxygen delivery two folds during flapping flight wings. And high altitude birds have larger lungs with a greater surface area and a thinner diffusion, uh, this pulmonary arteries, arteries to load oxygen in the blood more effectively while in the hypoxic environment. So just wanted to explain these two steps so that you could get the better idea of the psychological adaptations of few of the unique species. Then we have biochemical adaptation. The adaptive uh, you know, process in high altitude wildlife, as I already mentioned, it's very complex and all the adaptive processes, they are interrelated. 
but the biochemical adaptation that appears to be more important as far as the tolerance to hypoxia is concerned. There are, uh, you know, overwhelming uh, evidences that show some significant subcellular changes that are taking place in few of the animals, like wild yak is the best example for that. The cold hypoxic conditions of high altitude habitats impose severe metabolic uh, demands on the en endothermic uh, vertebrates. Their high blood hemoglobin concent concentrations enable the high altitude animals and the birds to adapt to tolerate uh, the low atmospheric pressure at these peaks. And there are studies in wild yak that shows that there are some significant changes which are taking place at their cellular level and which shows that yak have a lower rate of uh, you know, urinary nitrogen ex excretion. They don't excrete and more efficient nitrogen util utilization in spite they don't uh, you know they don't defecate, defecate they don't urinate and in spite they use this waste material they recycle it to produce the uh, protein for their bodies and this ability is believed to assist them in the rapid recovery of the body weight over the summer grazing period in addition the low maintenance protein requirements, the low surface area of the yak's body result in a low metabolic rate. So to sum up all this, we can say that a reduced heat production, decreased respiration so that they don't lose water uh, during respiration and sweating, and reduced metabolism. And if efficient nitrogen utilization. All these attributes are the major biochemical mechanisms for yak to survive at high altitudes. Next comes the genetic adaptation. The genetic mechanism for adapt, uh, adaptation to high altitude appears to be more complicated than you know than the physiological adaptation and the morphological adaptation and all other adaptations animals have genetically evolved in high elevation environments to exhibit numerous adaptations to counter these environmental challenges such as some have altered their developmental rates some have altered the body sizes there is the increased pulmonary ventilation in the animals at the high altitudes, and they have the increased hemoglobin oxygen affinity so that they could do well in the, um, you know, uh, less levels of oxygen. And several, you know, these uh, adaptations to high elevations, they appear uh, in the animal gradually. It's not just, you know, uh, a month's job or a year's, uh, you know, job. It rises gradually, it evolves gradually, and it evolves continuously with the increasing elevational distribution. Several researches and studies, you know, they are going on uh, to study about the adaptive behavior of the high altitude animals, where they are genetically uh, compared to their counterparts uh, in the low lying areas and significant variation have been noticed in them in the high altitude animals which they have attained over the period of time to combat the threats uh, you know uh, to their survival and during one such research it has been found that the himalayan marmot have evolved from the ground squirrels and this divergence time between the Himalayan marmot and the ground squirrel was estimated to be more than 9.8 million years. So that is a huge time difference. Behavioral adaptation. 
behavioral adaptation is um, you know something which an animal does in response to some type of stimuli external stimuli uh, you know in order to survive well there have been several uh, behavioral adaptations in high altitude animals which give them a you know uh, fair chance uh, to survive to reproduce to defend and to prey again you know these adaptations they have involved in them over a period of time like descending to the lower elevations in harsh winters this can be very well seen in the in the ungulates and here i could cite the example of uh, our uh, pride our state uh, state animal the kashmir hangul who descends to the lower elevations during the winters and goes back to higher elevations to uh, you know uh, during the summer months and during the you know during uh, descent uh, to the lower elevations they give birth to their young ones so you know this is a proper mechanism this is a proper behavioral adaptation where they descend and they have uh, they have the you know they can they can thrive well and do um, do adapt to the lower elevations give birth to their young ones and then during summer they go they go back to the higher elevations <clears throat> another uh, um, you know behavioral adaptation can be seen that they live and hunt like wolves they live and they hunt in packs to increase chances of predation and defend themselves cooperatively resorting to the hibernation again uh, you know few of the animals like uh, bears marmots and other animals they resort to the hibernation during these tough times then brumation in kind <coughs> in case of reptiles the hibernation of reptiles is known as the brumation they brumate together so that they could <clears throat> they could retain their body heat because because when they are together in the den and their den is called hibernaculum so in hibernaculum they, you there you can see the hundreds of snakes <clears throat> and they brumate together so that they could retain their body heat and during this brumation the metabolism rate of the reptiles decreases sharply and they don't feel the need to you know to prey and to feed and it has been seen that few of the reptiles they can starve altogether for months during this brumation period so this brumation can be very well explained with the example of himalayan pit vipers that Uh, inhabits the range of more than three thousand meters above sea level. So one can imagine how they uh, do well at such altitude and in such harsh conditions. So this was all for today's presentation, and I hope I was able to, uh, you know. explain and i was able to deliver my experiences i was able to share my experiences with you so thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to be in front of you and to speak and to interact with you thank you so much thank you ma'am uh, i think now we can move on to uh, the question and answer session and we have a few questions lined up for you and i will just read them out for you all right so i think one of the first questions we have is somebody called mohit uh who says it's 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 world otter day today and uh, so he would like to know about the presence and distribution of otter species in jammu kashmir and ladakh uh yes it was earlier found here uh we 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 were having the uh, otter species one of the otter species uh in 
Kashmir region. But nowadays there is no research, no study on the on that species. And once few boys they took up a, a small project for few months. They tried to look for the otters, but they couldn't find them. So we can, you know, uh, for now we can say that they are extinct from this place. But you know, you can never say no to any research. There, there can be a chance that we can, if we work more hard, we can find them. But unfortunately, there has been no one who, you know, who is interested in working on the otters in uh, this place. Oh, right, ma'am. Uh, so another question we have from Dhruv is, uh, uh, why is a Ramsar tag uh, important for wetlands? Uh, so during my stay, uh, uh, during my recent visit to Mansa Lake in Jammu, uh, Ramsar Convention, a convention uh, conservation site, uh, there was hardly any visible action for conservation. Uh, the entire coast of the lake was being concretized uh, with shops and people uh, feeding weed dough to fishes, plastic floating around, uh, even fishes consuming it. Um, hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Ramsar uh, is, you know, uh, Ramsar uh, Convention is very important because it notifies the wetland as one of the important um, areas, one of the important wetlands, and that could help the wetland to rejuvenate, to refresh itself. And people uh, who are working in the departments, who are working with the forest departments or who are working with some organizations and the common people, when they, you know, when they learn about the tag, the Ramsar site, they get some, uh, you know, some kind of uh, feel that this, uh, this place is something special and it has a great uh, value for us. And we should do some positive steps to rejuvenate and to refresh this uh, water body. But yes, unfortunately, we people are so greedy that, you know, we are degrading the environment. We are just looking for our uh, greeds. We are just working to fulfill our uh, greeds, which are, which are, you know, which have no end. And, and you know, we have no sense to uh, to look after the environment, to look after the nature, which has given us so much. And this is very unfortunate on part, or you know, on our part. But uh, nowadays, lot of awareness workshops and other things are going on for these Ramsar sites as. Recently, our wildlife department, they are also, uh, you know, uh, they have also organized one month of uh, cleaning for these wetland areas under which uh, the uh, Hokarsar and the Wooler, they are uh, properly taken care about. And a lot of cleaning drives, a lot of work is going on these two sites. So yes, nominating them as Ram Ramsar sites makes them little important for all of us. Right, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Uh, another question we have is, uh, why is the Western uh, Tragopan endangered in the Jammu and Kashmir? Yeah. Obviously they are endangered because their number is very less in this place. They are preyed upon uh, like uh, snow leopard, uh, they prey upon these species. Then there is poaching and hunting of uh, this uh, species. And all these things, they have made them threatened and decrease their number. Hmm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, next po question. Poaching is one of, yeah, poaching is one of the biggest threats in the Himalayas. Poaching hmm. for everyone, for snow leopard, you know, for hangul, for these, beautiful birds. Poaching is a big threat for all of these animals. Yes, mom. 
so another question that we have is uh, do bears adapt these changes uh, to these changes that you mentioned when they are brought to zoos situated at plains um, yes yeah, i think that's an yes. interesting question very interesting question uh, yes i have experienced this in you know in my own capacity we have two brown bears at two uh, two of our centers one is at dachiga which is a plain, which is a low-lying area uh, and have an altitude of about 1,500 to 1,600 meters above sea level. Then we have Pahalgam, which is at an altitude of uh, 2,700 meters above sea level. And we have brown bear at uh, Dachigam and at Pahalgam. And both these brown bears, I have been watching them since uh, four or five years now. And you know, uh, I when the uh, October and the September, when September and the October months come, they start digging their dens. And one of our uh, brown bears at Dachigam, he dug the concrete den in just one night. And we were amazed to see, you know, such deep digging. And the concrete digging, it, it was not the mud. It was the concrete. It was his concrete den, which he dug in just one night to make a den for himself and to hibernate there. And this trait was seen in the uh, brown bear, which is at our Pahal Pahalgam uh, Rescue Center, Pahalgam Rehabilitation Center. This was seen in him also. And he continuously dug the den for three consecutive years. The October comes and he starts digging. So, you know, this was very uh, uh, interesting to see uh, such digging behavior in these animals. It's very interesting. Um, and talking about, yeah, here I would like to talk about their behavioral adaptation. In, uh, see, Sonmarg is... Uh, Again, a place with the, um, you know, high altitudes and its, its altitude starts from 2,700 meters above sea level and its peaks, they can reach up to 6,000 meters above sea level. And this is the, uh, you know, uh, one of the areas where we can uh, see a snow leopard, where we can see brown bears. And in brown bears, we have seen the behavioral adaptation of getting used to the supplement feeding of garbage bins. And this behavioral adaptation, they have, uh, they have you know, uh, slowly attained because when they saw that the food is easily available at the low lying areas, why to go, you know, uh, upper reaches, why to uh, hunt and why to do, why to look for the uh, prey. So since they were getting the easy food at the garbage dumps of the hotels, of the houses, they were, they got used to, uh, you know, raid those dumps and to, uh, you know, feed themselves from those uh, garbage sites. So this is the another behave, uh, behavioral adaptation which we have seen in brown bears in Sonmark landscape. And this was not all. This trait was seen in them uh, during the winter months also. And we were amazed that they have not gone for the you know, hibernation. So this, from this you know, um, example, we can say that their behavior is changing. They are not going to the hibernation. Instead, since they are getting the easy food, they are staying there only. <coughs> Very interesting, ma'am. Um, I think we have uh, time for at least two or three more questions. Uh, so the next question I think we can take is, uh, um, as we are experiencing the boom in tourism in the Western Himalayas and rampant development activities, uh, how do you see this as a challenge to wildlife? It is the biggest challenge to the wildlife because tourism, which is not checked, which is not regulated, it's the biggest threat to the uh, animals living in these high altitude areas. Again, 
I could cite an example from the Sonmarg area, from the Sonmarg landscape, which is one of the best tourist places in Jammu and Kashmir. Here we can see a lot of roads, you know, new roads are coming up. Uh, then there are, uh, you know, tunnels coming up uh, that connects Sonmarg to the Ladakh area. There is the boom of the tourist who don't stop even during the summer months, sorry, uh, winter months. And they are actually the big threat to these animals because they have raided their uh, habitat. They have degraded their habitat. They have fragmented their habitat, which is not at all good for the uh, animals who live in these high mountain peaks. And you know, it has been, there is a research that says that within a few years, 30% of the snow leopard and brown bear habitat is going to shrink. So you can imagine, you know, how much impact the tourism is having on the habitat and on the lives of these animals. More tourists means more garbage. More tourists means more, uh, you know, uh, more uh, the thing uh, in animals, in animals' life. So that is not at all good for these animals. Yes, ma'am. That is definitely very true. Um, okay, we have, I think, uh, one more question that we can take. Uh, so, could you comment on the current conservation-oriented research going on in the area as of now? And uh, how much uh, uh, is the awareness levels of the locals residing um, in your area? Uh, see, there are few organizations who are working on different uh, conservation projects, like there are people, there is organization who is working on the Markor. Uh, we are working on the conservation of Himalayan black bears and Himalayan brown bears, as well as on the education and awareness of the local masses. And, you know, I can say from my uh, personal experiences that yes, uh, the attitude of the people are changing, but this change is very slow. You know, we have to uh, change the knowledge of the people so that their uh, attitude, their behavior towards these uh, animals that could change. And, you know, uh, since the uh, habitat of these animals are shrinking, since they, they're, uh, because of this uh, habitat shrinking, their behavior is changing since they don't get the proper uh, feed in their own habitat. So they uh, move towards the lower elevation, they move towards the human habitations, and they, uh, you know, uh, come in interface with the humans. That's why the humans, they are not in good relationship with these animals. But we have to change the people's perception that, uh, you know, it is we who are responsible for all the problems we are facing. It's we, we have encroached the their uh, habitat. It's we, we have degraded their habitat. It's we who have, uh, you know, uh, changed the land use pattern. It's we because of whom the climate is changing. So it should be we who have to put everything at the right place. So we should make steps. We should work, especially with the children so that they could, uh, you know, in near future, they could uh, do something positive uh, for the conservation of these animals because they are going to our future, uh, you know, uh, leaders. Maybe in near future, they will be at the, uh, you know, at the positions where they could be uh, policy makers. And if they have the right knowledge about the right issue, they can make the policies which can be good for these animals. That was really wonderfully said, ma'am. Uh, it definitely does lie on us to make, uh, to see the change that uh, 
we uh, you know we would like to have we would like to see uh, so with that i would like to uh, say thank you again to alia ma'am and uh, in case if we have missed your question i would please i would recommend you guys to just uh, write to us as well on our uh, email id that's mentioned uh, so with that again thank you again so much uh, uh, alia ma'am and uh, you have given us so much insight about high altitude wildlife and it's definitely something for us uh, we've taken a lot from the session uh, so thank you again and uh, for further updates on webinars uh, that uh, are from wildlife sos do have a look and keep an eye out on our social media um, yeah Aliyama? thank you so much uh, thank you uh, anisha and the whole uh, communication team uh, for giving me an opportunity to speak in front of uh, you know learn people like we we are having today so it was again a learning for me uh, and thank you everyone. Thank you so much ma'am. And thank you everyone who joined and we hope to see you again soon. <laughs>